Welcome to The Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now, here's a message from Pastor Jim Cobray. As you take your seat, get your Bible, and I want you to turn with me, if you will, into 2 Samuel. Before we go to 2 Samuel, as you find 2 Samuel, I want to talk to you about something that God placed on my heart in the middle of the night last night. I had a different message. In the middle of the night, God speaks to me. I, I just can't stand that. I hate that, you know, when God just interrupts me at 1 o'clock in the morning. And, and it's like, I don't know. I, I don't want to be rebellious. And when God speaks, I want to listen anytime. But it's like, could we do this at 8 o'clock in the morning? What do we have to do it at 1 o'clock in the morning about? And uh, So I'm up in the middle of the night gathering thoughts and talking and having an outline on something that's very important. God spoke to me. He said there's some characteristics of people in the Bible that make them very special. And then there's some characteristics of people in the Bible that make them losers. And I, I immediately my ears perked up and I, I, I wanted to hear more. And if you'll research this, it's absolutely completely 100% true. Listen closely to what I'm going to say that there's a common, if you will, thread that is woven through the hearts of men and women who are great in the Bible. There's a number of things that they do that make them great, and they've all done it. And then you'll find that there is a common thread for people who have failed in the Bible. That means they've all done it, and that was the reasons for their failure. You'll, you'll find that. Very simple to understand. Tonight, the title of this message is called The Adventure of Courage. Because you can believe God all you want, but if you don't have the courage to keep on keeping on, your faith isn't going to do very much at all. And you will find that every great person in the Bible, man or woman, truly, as you look at their life, one of the things that's outstanding is they were able to apply courage to wherever it is that they're at. In this room tonight, there's all kinds of people. There are people that are hurting because of pain in your bodies and physical ailment in your life. There may not be in your life much hope for that to change. There's people in this room this night where your economics have failed and you don't know how you're going to make it in the months to come. People have lost their jobs or you don't know how to pay your bills and you don't know how things are going to work. And man, you're, you're really needing a miracle from God economically. There's people in this room tonight where you've heard something from God and you absolutely have no idea how it's going to come to pass. It's going to take a miracle for it to even start to come to pass. But let me share something with you. The, one of the qualities you're going to have to have until it does come to pass, whatever it is you're believing God for, is this little adventure called courage. Oftentimes we don't think about it, but if you stop, and I was thinking about it just this morning as we were talking about Mary and talking about Joseph, what courage it took for them to receive and the word of God and say a comment like, be it on to me, Lord. And then to go forward with the things that they go forward. Don't tell me that doesn't take great courage. They are great people in the Bible because they showed and demonstrated this one little quality of great courage in following God. A lot of times, you know, we can quote the scripture. A lot of times we, we can, you know, debate the scripture. A lot of times we can feel the scripture. Sometimes we can, you know, speak those confessions of faith. But it doesn't do any good until you get into a place where you have enough courage to demonstrate what it is you are believing God for. A lot of times we fail in that area and we don't realize that the people that demonstrate and show courage are the people who God seems to back. Can you imagine the wise men traveling as far as they did off of some little teeny word found in some obscure little scripture written by a prophet in those days that wasn't even very great of a prophet. In fact, it showed himself from time to time as an unrighteous prophet. And yet they packed up and they got on 
whatever it was, their camels, and they started moving across the land, prepared to, I mean, that took courage, guys. It takes courage for Abraham to leave the comfort of his home and the wealth of his family and get to a place where he needed to go. It takes courage for whomever it is he'll find of great faith, Rahab, as she hides the spies that come in. Great courage, how about when David is running from Saul, the king of Israel, and even his brothers were against him. Great courage to keep on going in the things of God. It's easy at times to give up because things don't happen the way that we want them to happen. It's easy to make an excuse and justify why we don't continue. We're filled with people who can hardly wait and get it on board with us and tell us it's okay, that that's the way it is. When God's looking for somebody with great courage, can you imagine the courage it took to follow Jesus when times got tough, when lives were being threatened, can you imagine after Jesus is buried and gone and all of a sudden the disciples were by themselves and they were witnesses to a lost and dying world themselves and what kind of courage that had to take for them to stand in the face of the persecution of the people that are around them. How about Daniel if you go through that with Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, you want to talk about courage? Here's this crazy madman called Nebuchadnezzar the king over the Babylonian territory, the most powerful man on the planet at that time. And he makes a statement, he'll either bow down and worship me or I'll fire up these furnaces so hot that they'll consume you and we're going to throw you, Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, into that fiery furnace. And when they said, we will not bow down, they fired up those furnaces how many times? Seven times, I think it was, hotter than normal. So hot that it burned up the guards that are on the outside of the furnace. Then, then did it not take courage to be grabbed by the guards and thrown in to that fire? To great courage. And they said, no matter, even if God doesn't even come and rescue us, we'll still not bow down. Serve you to great courage. I mean, you stop and think about every person throughout the Bible that's anybody, every person that's used an example, the one definite quality is not only just faith, but the courage in their faith. Because see, courage, you can muster up so much from yourself. Courage is the depth of your faith expressed on how well you'll fight with God and fight for God. So important for us. The depth of your belief in God comes out in a godly courage that keeps you going until you achieve what it is you need to achieve. And everybody that didn't have courage and didn't display courage, did you know there's one thing you could say about them? Loss, not gain, loss in their world and in their life. Children of Israel going into the promised land, they didn't have courage to face the giants. Lost. But David faces a giant that all of Israel is afraid of and great gain. Such an easy thing for us to skip over courage. Because we live in this real world, tangible things where two plus two makes four. And oftentimes we find ourselves in a place of evaluating our future based on what other people have said are the experiences of the people around us. And when we do that, all of a sudden, our courage starts to shake. I know somebody who tried it, and they failed. Why, well, I, I was there myself at one time and excited about God like you, but then I found out it really wasn't as great as it was. Can I tell you something? It's the people that stay in through all the persecution, trial, pressure, temptations of life that express the courage in order to obtain the promises that God has for them. And you will never, ever get anything from God if you and I don't get on this adventure of courage in our life. It's going to take courage for you to fulfill the plan that God has placed in your heart. It's going to take courage for you to fulfill your desires that God has said his approval over. It's going to take courage for you to be all that God's called you to be. And at the end of your life, you look back at it and say, man, is God faithful? And I'm grateful that I was faithful too. 
because God came through in a great way. It takes courage for that to take place. This is not just something you try. This is something you live in the adventure of courage. My goodness sakes alive, Joseph. Here he is, thrown in prison, persecuted by his brothers in a prison. Can you imagine what an Egyptian prison must have looked like smell like and was like in the days, if you will, of Pharaoh. Can you imagine the hardship and the filthy water and food, living conditions and rats that live there, the sanitary conditions? And year after year, he had to have courage to believe in the dream that hadn't come to pass. In fact, the exact opposite took place. It takes courage to keep on going. That's what I'm saying. God is looking at a people, looking for a people that will evaluate life and stay in there because of the courage and the depth of their faith in who God is. It's not easy to make things happen in life. And it takes courage to keep on keeping on doing what God would have you to do, especially when you don't see the results today and everybody says, man, why are you doing that? Get out, that's crazy. Sure, it's crazy, but God spoke, and if you hang in there, God's looking just to see. In fact, it's through this courage that he develops the very character of our heart that he can use in order to bring the promises of God. My time with God, I just wanted to share this with you. I had, if you will, defined a couple of things, and I could probably define it in about 40 different ways. But courage, I want to just pop this up on the overhead. The God-given ability to live out life his way. That's what courage really is. The God-given ability, that's like the grace of God that helps me to get through. But it's the God-given ability to live out life his way. Or the godly stand for what is righteous. You'll be confronted with a lot of things in life that are easier, more acceptable, sociably acceptable, family acceptable, people that will pat you on the back if you don't go on and continue with God. But here, if you make a godly stand for that righteousness, now you're demonstrating great courage. And God will reward you. I want to take you to the Old Testament in 2 Samuel. If you'll go there, I want to give you some things that it's, I could probably give you 40, but God only gave me four. Things to kind of look at with the word courage. There are times when you're going to need to be a person of courage. Courage, number one, in the face of the powerful. I, I just want to say this to you, that so many people intimidate us in this world. So many people stop us just because we feel less than, than somebody else. We feel like we're a lesser person. Sometimes we put our education out there and that gives us confidence and gives us courage, but it only go take us so far because there's always somebody smarter and with more degrees and has more insight on things. Sometimes we look at our checkbooks, our, our savings account, our jobs, or the money that we have, or the position on our business card, and we draw our courage from that, when God is looking for a people who would draw courage from him, based on who he is, not based on the people around us, and you will be confronted in your walk in life and in this adventure by being intimidated by men and women who will make you feel less than who you really are in the sight of God. And we need to be a people who are courageous in the face of of the powerful because you will be in front of people who are powerful and you'll have to stand up just like you see the disciples stood up in the faces of kings and high priests and were courageous in the things of God. In 2 Samuel, there's a story of a man, of course, as you know him to be David, king, greatest king Israel's ever known. King David is mighty in all that he does and all that he says, respected by everybody at this point in his life. 
The things that Samuel had said over David have come to pass. And he's one of the great kings that has brought great commerce in. People have gotten rich in Israel, doubled the boundaries of Israel, and people have made a lot of money. Therefore, if you will, King David was great. And we find a story here where a man is called by God to go tell King David a truth. And it's not easy. A lot of people don't think that King David was very tough and rugged because he sang songs and had a deep relationship with God. But this man had had so much blood in his past and in his background, so many murders, if you will, so many slaughters of people slaughtering people that he had too much blood in his hand to build the temple of God. This is a rough man, if you will. This is a man who's not a little timid person. This is a person that if you made angry, you might just simply quickly die. And this guy gets this assignment to tell him something he's not going to like. His name, if you will, is Nathan, a prophet of God. Let me tell you the story, and then I'm going to read it to you out of the 12th chapter of 2 Samuel. When David was coming up as a king, he was an adulterer and a murderer. Don't tell me God only uses perfect people. Don't tell me God can't use people with a lousy background. Don't tell me God only looks for those who have never made mistakes. He was an adulterer and a murderer. He had held, had a relationship with a, man, a man's wife, and as he was having a relationship with a man's wife, she got pregnant. The man was off to war. And as he brought this man back to spend a night with his wife so that nobody would know that he made her pregnant, he would not have a relationship with his wife. He said, I'll not go into my wife as long as my men are on the front line fighting and I'm laying with my wife. It isn't going to happen. So he stayed outside of the house. That's the kind of a man he was. Total, complete integrity. So David sends him back realizing he's trapped and he tells his men, put him on the front line in a battle. Now listen to, the, listen to this, listen to this. Put him on the front line of the battle and then all of us guys that are on our side withdraw and leave him out there. And they all withdraw if they put him on the front line. He's there by himself and he gets slaughtered and he dies. His name is Uriah. And David goes on and he marries Uriah's wife. They have children. And years have gone by, now God, who doesn't forget, tells this man, if you will, Nathan, to go and talk to David. And I'll tell you what he says to David. The assignment was to let David know that God had not forgotten how he murdered this man. And David would have to pay the price for it in the eyes of God. Let me tell you something. Don't think for a moment that wasn't an easy assignment. It wasn't. Here's David, a man who's quick, a man who knows how to fight, a man who's killed many people. Here's David that had too much blood on his hand. And now think about you getting the assignment to go tell David where he's really at and that his family's going to be cursed because of what he's done. You have got to have great courage in the face of the powerful. For some of you today, you look at people that are working around you and you see them as more powerful than yourself. You see them as more influential than you. You see them as better than you. And until you start to take the courage that God made you a child of God, that you have worth and you have value, you will never carry the message that God wants you to carry and never be what God wants you to be as long as you see everybody else more powerful than you. 
And Nathan gets this message and he's got to go and we find it in the second, cha- second if you will, Samuel, in the 12th chapter, verse, if you will, in verse number seven. Then Nathan said to David, after he tells him the story, he tells him the story about how David, uh, how this man was in town who was a rich man. And the rich man had a, a little sheep and this sheep was cuddled and taken care of by the family, but this poor man had this one sheep, and the rich man didn't want to kill his sheep, but he killed the poor man's sheep and took what the poor man had. Instead of killing one of the many sheep that the rich man had, he took that one sheep that the poor man had. And David was so angry about the story, and he says, who is that guy? He's going to die. And Nathan says this in verse number seven. He says to David, you are the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel. I delivered unto you from the hand of Saul, verse number eight. He says, I gave you your master's house and your master's wives unto your keeping and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if you had been uh, too little, I also would have given you much, much more. And then it goes on, if you will, in verse number nine, it says, and why have you despised the commandments of the Lord and do evil in his sight? You have killed Uriah the Hittite with a sword and you have taken his wife to be your wife and you have killed him with the sword and of the people of Ammon. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Let me tell you something, unless we are bold in the face of the powerful, we will never be bold anywhere. You will be confronted all of your life with people who will intimidate you. And because of that intimidation, it cannot keep you quiet. If Nathan had been said, listen, Lord, that's too great of an assignment. I can't tell David that. I might lose my life. I might die right there on the spot. My goodness sakes alive. Do you know how many people are intimidated by other people? Therefore, they never go ahead and do anything because guess what? The courage dries up to complete the job. How many times has God given us an assignment to do something? I wonder if God ever played a playback to the church in America that said, I want you to go, I want you to say, I want you to do. And all of a sudden, we were intimidated by the people who was telling us to go. And we never went. We never did anything because we're afraid of something. It takes courage to carry out what God said to do. And without the courage, you will never be the victorious person that God called you and I to be. Somebody ought to say amen. The second thing God showed me is this about courage. You and I need to have courage to carry out the assignment, not only to face the powerful, but to carry out the assignment. Oftentimes we look at life and we think it's just too difficult. It's just too crazy. I don't know how I can make it. I don't know how and what way I can do this. Can I tell you something? Your future is full of questions like that. And it's courage right now, every day, that gets you through how you're going to make it. I tell you, more people ask, how is it going to work? And you know something? If you want to know the truth, there is nobody giving you the answer on how it's going to work. If you have the answer on how it's going to work, you will absolutely, let me tell you something, you got the wrong assignment. Usually God gives you an assignment. You don't know how it's going to work. And then you find yourself in the scripture as you look at the word of the Lord in 1 Kings, the 21st chapter. Go there with me. 1 Kings in the 21st chapter. And we see Elijah with King Ahab. Elijah is, is a prophet of God. And in 1 Kings 21, I'll tell you the story and then I'll read you the verse and listen to what takes place. That There's 22 chapters. Go to the 21st one. You find here, there's this guy, if you will, by the name of Naboth. Naboth is an interesting person. He owns a vineyard. He owns a, like a farm right next to King, uh, uh, if you will, Ahab. King Ahab is a miserably 
horrible, a demonic, bad king. He had just as soon cut your throat in a second. But I want you to know he knows somebody who's worse than him. And that's his wife. She'd cut your throat in a half a second. And she was a horrible, horrible woman and a horrible, horrible wife. And he, if you will, King Ahab wanted the guy's farm that was next to his farm. He offered him all kinds of things, but it was an inheritance from his family. He didn't want to give it up at all, so he said no. And he goes and gets very discouraged, King Ahab does. He's got his head down. He's kind of depressed and discouraged about it. His wife comes in, and she is a tyrant. She says, what's wrong with you? He says, well, I offered, if you will, Naboth uh, his money for this farm. And he said, no, it's part of his errand. I'll never get that farm. She says, well, you know, you need to start exercising some authority. Let me share with you, you're going to have that farm. Well, what she does is she sends out a bunch of people, lie about Naboth. They take him and they stone him to death because he was falsely accused. He's now dead. Now she comes to her husband, King Ahab, and she says, well, he's dead. The farm's yours. He takes the farm. And in doing so, you find out there's this horrible assignment that this prophet of God has by the name of Elijah. Elijah now has the assignment from God to go confront King Ahab, who's married to Jezebel. You've heard the word Jezebel many times, and it's in relationship with somebody who's bad. The reason why, because that was King Ahab's wife's name, Jezebel. So all of a sudden, here you find this prophet of God having to confront. Notice what the point being is. If we don't have the courage to carry out an assignment, an assignment will not be carried out. And how many times has God spoken to different people that never carry out an assignment because it's too difficult or maybe it's too much problems? Here we find in 1 Kings, the 21st chapter, if you will, in verse 17, it says, And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite. I always love the word Tishbite. I mean, can you tell me what, you could, Dr. Kobernick, but nobody else, could you tell me what a Tishbite is? I just love the idea that God identifies who Elijah is, and really a Tishbite is not very much. And God tells me, that tells me that God is not looking for the great, he's just looking for somebody who will carry out an assignment. And here happens to be Elijah the Tishbite. Okay. Says to him these words, if you will, in verse to me, arise and go down and meet Ahab, the king of Israel. Right there, that's petrifying. Right there is a man that's powerful, but now he's going to give him this assignment. So he has to get past the powerful and get into the assignment. Now watch this. He says, verse to me, arise and go down to king Ahab of Israel, who lives in Samaria. There he is in a vineyard of Naboth where he has gone down to take possession of it. Remember, he went down, he stole this guy, had him killed so he could get his vineyard. He says, and you shall speak to him saying, thus saith the Lord, have you have murdered, <laughs> I mean, could you give me a better assignment than this? This guy is a bad guy. You have murdered, also taken possession. And you shall speak to him saying, thus saith the Lord, in the place where the dogs lick the blood of Naboth, dogs shall lick your blood, even yours. And then he says these words in verse number 20, and Ahab said to Elijah, and what have you found in me, O enemy? And answered, I have found you because you have sold yourself to do evil in the sight of the Lord. And then he says these words. He says that God's going to take everything from you, and God told me to tell you. Can I tell you something? Sometimes God will give you an assignment that you don't want to carry out, but it's an assignment from God, and when you carry it out, you help fulfill the plan of God. God's looking for people who will be courageous, and not just courageous to the easy, courageous in times that are very difficult. 
So two things we've seen. You've got to be courageous to the powerful, those people that want to intimidate you. And then you're going to have to be courageous to the place that you carry out an assignment that God gives you, even if the assignment is difficult to carry out. Third thing God gave me to give to you is this. Courage to put it all on the line. I love these words over and over. I actually hate the words. Putting it all on the line is wonderful once, maybe twice, but to keep doing it over and over, there comes a time when you have, the just shall live by, the just shall live for a little while, by, uh, the just shall live in the early days, the just, no, you're going to have to be all on the line all the time. And that's what courageous is all about. In the book of Daniel, here's Daniel, he's an old man, He's gone through the years of Nebuchadnezzar, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We talked about that just a few minutes ago. Here is, if you will, Daniel in this older years. I don't know how old he is. He's probably in his 70s at this time. He's already been exalted in the land. God's already come through for him. His life has been at stake throughout this whole situation numerous times. You'll find Daniel now in his older days does not go back to Jerusalem, but stays in this land, if you will, of Nebuchadnezzar. And now Daniel is being confronted by the king whose name is Belteshazzar. And Belteshazzar is, if you will, is the great grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. And it's really interesting because Belteshazzar is having a party. The Medo-Persians are outside. An army of the Medo-Persians are wanting to take Babylon. Babylon is considered to be an impregnable city. And so he calls his wives and his concubines in. And he's going to have a party inside of this fortress of Babylon. Because it's never, ever been penetrated by any enemy. And he has this drunken party. And what takes place if you'll remember reading in the fifth chapter of Daniel, is a hand comes out and starts to write on the wall some words. I mean, he's so out of it, and all of a sudden, all of his concubines and his perverted Babylonian activity has taken place, and here comes a hand out of the room and out of the, and it writes on the wall some letters. Man, that'll freak you out. And it caught his attention. His knees started knocking. He didn't know what to do about it. His joints started aching. He was falling apart. When one of his wives comes to him and says, there's an old man that served your father well, Nebuchadnezzar, your grandfather. And he's still around and his name is Daniel. If you call him, I'm sure he could interpret. So they call Daniel. Now, I'm sure Daniel was at that place in his life where he was just simply at rest and relationship with God, having a good time. God had come through for him. God had been faithful for him. God had done great, mighty, marvelous things. He's just kind of living out life. And here comes again and again. Courage, if you will, that puts it all on the line over and over. Daniel is called in and Daniel reads the writing on the wall. It says that God has weighed you and found you too light. And tonight the Medo-Persians will come and take your city and within hours. That city that never fell before that night it fell. Don't mess with God. An amazing story. He had to put his life, I thought about it, he had to put his life on the line once again. He had to get out of his comfort zone. Can I just say something? When you live by faith, it doesn't mean you just do this once. You're going to have to be someone of courage through the entire time you are on this planet. Whether you're young and in courage, you're going to have to also be encouraged in a place of encouragement as an old person too. Because it's the same God you're serving and God's looking for people of great courage. And in Daniel, if you will, the fifth chapter, verse 22, it says this, but you, his son, Belteshazzar, have not humbled your heart, although you knew all of this. You have filled yourself up against the Lord of heaven. 
They have brought the vessels from his house before you, and you and your lords and your wives and your concubine have drank wine from them. And you have praised the gods of silver and gold, bronze, iron and wood and stone, which you do not see or hear or know. And the God who holds your breath in his hand and owns all of your ways, you have not glorified. What an assignment. Don't tell me his life wasn't one moment, one breath from that king. Kill this old man. He'd have been cut in pieces and instantly. And I'm going to tell you something, saints of God. Sometimes your assignment from God to carry out is just simply tell somebody about Jesus. Sometimes your assignment before God gives you a great assignment, you've got to be able to at least tell somebody about Jesus. Your assignment is just to live and to be a Christian. Your assignment is just to do righteousness, just to be righteous, just to fight for righteousness. Your assignment is just to exalt the name of Jesus. And sometimes we don't even do that. We come into the house of God and we fall asleep. And all of a sudden, God looking for people who will be courageous in these last days who will raise up the flag and the banner of Jesus Christ and tell a lost and dying world it won't be popular, but it'll be the message they need to hear. I don't know about you. God's calling us to be courageous, to do what God would have us to do. Let's go to the New Testament just for a quick example, if you will. Peter and John are in the healing crusade in Acts, the fourth chapter. Here's my point, if you will, if you want to write it down, number four, you're going to have to have courage to do what is righteous. And here's Peter and John. They've come off a little healing crusade and salvations are pouring out in the fourth chapter of Acts. And Here's Peter preaching the gospel and the people that hear it don't like it. Have you ever been around people nowadays? that don't like to hear what you have to say about Jesus. We live in a society that takes Jesus out of everything. Everybody's coming along saying happy holiday. I want you to know something. It's not a happy holiday without Jesus Christ being on the throne. That's the only way it'll ever be a happy holiday. And God's looking for somebody to stand up and say, no, it's just not a holiday. It's the day of the birth of the Messiah, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And you need to be happy because it's Jesus' birthday. We're celebrating this time of year. But a lot of times we don't see it that way. Courageous to do what is righteous oftentimes is put aside because we're embarrassed about what people think of us. Or we care more about ourselves than we care about them. Or we care more about, you know, getting along. I, I hate it when churches turn into institutions. God has never made a church to be an institution. Acceptable by man. I want you to know something. The one mistake this church will make is when it tries to become acceptable to men. We don't need to be acceptable to men at this church. We need to be acceptable to God in this church. We need to be a people that say it like it is. And if you don't like it too bad, on the way out, I got speakers. I'm going to say it to you until you get to the parking lot. You got two choices. Don't come or get it. And then when I'm out in the field, I need to be also a person that's going to uphold righteousness. And that's what Peter and John were all about. I mean, here comes the religious leaders of the day. They had determined what they were saying about Jesus was wrong. And they make this statement, which every one of us ought to be holding to our hearts if you're going to be courageous. In the fourth chapter of Acts, verse number 18 says, And they called them and commended them that not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. I could just see those guys rolling their eyes. Like, mm-hmm, right, we're going to do that. I mean, we heard from God. We've been with God. We've seen God. We've talked to God. God's talked to us. And who are you in this fancy robe? Uh, I don't know if they ever talked that way to them, but I'll bet you they did. Verse, if you will, verse number 19 says it like this. And Peter and John answered and said, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. 
And they left it up to those people. You know something? They knew it's right to hear from God. Guys, God wants to use you. God wants to use me. God wants to do way beyond what you think God could ever do in your life. Blessing you, blessing the people around you. Wants to use you to exalt the name of Jesus to a lost and dying world. But number one, we cannot be afraid of those people that are powerful in our sight. We have to realize that that's just an obstacle that we go through. Don't you know that David stood before Goliath? He was a powerful man, but he also spoke the things of God. He was courageous, and in that courage, he won over the battle of Goliath. You and I are going to have to be people who are going to come along and be someone who is courageous to carry out the assignment, whatever it is that God gives us. And I found out about God. He gives you a little assignment at first to see if you'll be faithful to the little before he gives you a lot of assignment to someone else. Someone told me one time, I think I could preach better than you. I said to him, can I tell you this? You probably can. Your problem is you can't even witness a little bit in the streets. You want to come before the church. Go witness in the streets before you come to the church. Is anybody listening? Debbie and I wanted a place to preach. We went and preached at convalescent hospitals before we did anything. I remember meeting a couple that were 95 years old, husband and wife, holding hands. We were preaching to them in a convalescent hospital. You want to do the church? Go do the little assignment first. Are you hearing me? So if you can't carry out the assignment and courage, you can't do anything. And the third thing we've got to see is that God wants a people who are going to put it all on the line that are not afraid of the results. Hey, if you fail, you just win with God. If you fail with man, you win with God. Are you listening to me? And God's looking for a people who will simply be courageous to do what is righteous. God's called us. If we can't even do what's righteous, how can we ever follow the assignment of God? That's why we've got so many people coming and so many people going in churches nowadays because they're not courageous enough to stay during the tough times. And God's looking for somebody. Everybody that ever did anything great for God and with God are somebody who was courageous that stood in the face of all the problems and trials and pressure, just like that giant with David, and stood up to that giant said what he had to say and let God take the giant down but it takes courage for it to happen for all of us in here we're on an adventure not only of faith we're on an adventure of courage and it starts tonight in the house of God and you know it's true because if you read your Bible you'll see it all through the Bible it's very true. God uses people who have courage to do something. It takes guts. Amen? Amen? I'm finished. <laughs> just want to make sure that you're all right with God before you leave. Let's talk just for a moment. You can't, look, 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 look. Hold on. Listen to me now. You cannot go to heaven because you think you're a Christian. Cannot go to heaven because you're good. You cannot go to heaven because you go to church or don't go to church. You cannot go to heaven because your mom, dad took you to catechism class, Sunday school or Sabbath school class when you were a child. You don't get to heaven that way. You don't get to heaven because you join a church and you don't get to heaven because you're a wonderful friend of somebody that is a Christian. You get to heaven, the only way there is in the Bible is Jesus' way. In fact, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. So what he just said is you can't get to heaven your way or my way or some well-meaning church committee's way. You're not going to make it. You're going to have to get to heaven his way. And he tells us what that is in John, the third chapter. He says these words, you must be born again. Now, a lot of people don't like the words born again. Hollywood has made born again people look like idiots, fools, radicals, and goofy people. People have laughed at people who call themselves born again. There's been some born again people that have made, you know, foolish and jerky things out of their life. And, uh, and it puts a stigma on everybody. But Jesus wasn't messing around when he made that statement. He said, you must be born again. 
I find that the problem with a lot of people is they don't know what born again means. So let me explain it to you real quick and easy. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, God is looking for one thing. You know what that is? All of your heart and all of your life. This is not written just as a story so you could finally get it. You wouldn't have to have this many pages of a story so you could get it. This was written so without a shadow of a doubt, you would have information so that you could put all of your heart and all of your life into God and then be born again, headed for heaven, and denying your presence in hell. That's what this is all about. Always has been, always will be. God forgive us in American churches, we've watered that down and turned it into traditions. Traditions and ceremonial rituals. The bottom line is if God's after all of your heart and all of your life, then why doesn't he just take it? Because he doesn't do that. He wants you, a free will agent, to make a choice yourself for God. He could make you do it, couldn't he? He could hit you in the head with a two by four from heaven. He could make your life miserable. He could, do, he could make you do this, but he doesn't make you do it. He gives you the free will choice to choose to give God all of your heart and all of your life. It's a choice that you have to make. The only ones that are going to be happy in heaven are the ones that I choose to be with God. Not just somebody who makes me be with God. And that's the difference between born again and religion. And today, here we are in this safe, friendly place. And I want to make sure every one of you are right before God before you leave. So that if anything happens to you, you get to go to heaven and not go to hell. Hell is a very real place. Whether you believe in it or not, doesn't stop it from being real. It's very real. Jesus talked about it. It's a very real place. And you're going to go and live eternally either in heaven or in hell. It's your call, but it's your call. And if you give God all of your heart, you give God all of your life, that's a wholehearted commitment to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you get to go to heaven. That's what the Bible says. But if you don't, then it's your call, and you made your choice, and you've got the road laid out for you, and you can't do anything about it. That's the way it is. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father, but if you deny me, I'll deny you. That's what Jesus said. If you confess me before men, that takes courage, doesn't it? Did you know you can't get saved without courage? Did you know that the first people that are not going to make it in heaven you, know, you would think the people that don't make it to heaven, that go to hell, the first thing they'd say is the sinners, right? Did you know, listen to this. Did you know that the first person in the book of Revelation that talks about the people who are not going to make it to heaven are cowards, opposite of those that have courage? <laughs> it takes courage to give God all of your heart. It takes courage to give God all of your life. Can you imagine that? Cowards won't make it to heaven because it takes courage to make that kind of a commitment. It's not easy. Yeah, people make fun of you. Yeah, you're different than the world around you. But oh well, you get to go to heaven, have eternal life with Jesus. And that's what this is all about. So you say, well, Pastor Jim, how do I give God all my heart? How do I give him all my life? Let's do it God's way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go like this. One, two, three. I'm going to pop my hands together. Bang! When you hear that sound, bang! Your hand goes up. I'll see your hand. Now, who should raise their hand? If you've been running from God instead of to God most of the time of your life, I'm talking to you. Get ready to put your hand up because you haven't made a wholehearted commitment to Jesus yet. Your life shares that and says that because you're not running to him, you're running from him half the time. If you're one of those people that are not sure about whether you've given him all of your heart, then make sure. Put your hand up in a minute. If you're one of those people that are not sure about giving him all of your life and heart, give him, get your hand up. And I'll sit and put it right back down. We'll pray for you. 
If you're one of those people that are in here and you're saying to yourself, well, wait a minute, I prayed that prayer with Billy Graham at our Harvest Crusade, you know, where I invited Jesus in my heart. But here's my question. That's great. But did you follow through with all of your heart and life? Because, you know, there's no, now watch this. Don't, don't, don't miss this. There's no magical abracadabra formula that you can say that God is in heaven and says, oh, I heard them say the right formula called a prayer. I guess they get to come to heaven. Think about how stupid that is to believe God would do that. Don't treat God like he's an idiot. God watches your life that follows your heart as to whether or not you're really right with him. And if you're not right with him, here's this place that's safe, friendly. We love you, you know. And I'm asking you in a moment, as I pop my hands together, you get your hand up, let me see it, and then put it right back down. How simple is that? And be born again, headed for heaven, and denying your presence in hell. And tonight is your night of salvation. All across this auditorium, back to the family rooms, wherever you're at, back to this family room also, wherever you're at, get, your, get ready to put your hand up and put it right back down. You say, wait a minute, Pastor. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Uh-huh, you might be. But isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment in this safe and friendly place? Think about it. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment in this safe and friendly place than to be in hell forever and ever because you care more about what people think instead of what God sees? Sure, you might be embarrassed for a moment, but I won't embarrass you. And you put your hand right back down. How simple is that? You're just saying, I need you to pray for me so I can go to heaven. And I'll, tonight we'll pray together and you can go to heaven instead of hell. But you have to have the courage to do that. If you don't even have the courage to do that, you're certainly not going to have the courage to live for him outside of this safe, friendly place. Think about it. When you get on the workplace and someone says, what do you believe? Well, uh, 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 I, don't, I, I don't know, you know. You want to go along with everybody else. You just denied the Lord. It's crazy. But you have to have courage to say, oh, here's what I believe. And tell them what you believe. All across this auditorium, tonight there's a bunch of you need to get right with God. I'm going to ask you in a moment to put your hand up, put it right back down. How simple is that? Already hands getting ready to go up. You can do it all at one time. Hold on. We'll do it at the same time. I'm going to count three. Pop my hands together. You get your hand up. Put it right back down. Let me see that hand and then put it back down. Okay? Are you ready? Here it is. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one. There's two. Thank you. Back over here, thank you. Back over here, there's three, there's four, thank you, there's five, thank you, there's six, thank you, there's seven, thank you, God bless you. Anybody else, there's seven wise people, anybody else? There's eight, thank you, anybody else? Anybody else, real quick, there's eight wise people. Where's nine and 10? You know you need to get your hand up, I didn't embarrass them, I won't embarrass you, but you know this is about courage tonight. This is about you making the step and saying I need God, so hey, Keep in mind, the ones that don't make it are the ones that are cowards. But I can't talk you into this. You've got to want to do it from your heart. But I'm only going to give you a moment more. Anybody else? One more sweep through this place. Anybody else? There's eight wise people. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody? Well, let's give the Lord a great big praise for eight wise people. Okay, here's what I want from you. All eight of you that raised your hand, if you're serious about God, I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend. Get your stuff. I want you to, in a moment, get out of your seat. No one leaves during this period of time. And I want every one of you to get your stuff, get out of your seat. Anybody that didn't raise your hand but you're saying to yourself right now, I should have probably raised my hand, you, it's not too late. You can come too. I'll invite you to come. And you can get right with God. We'll pray together. It'll be wonderful. So let's stand and welcome them as they come. Come on. Give them a great big praise. Come on. Jesus, I believe. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Jesus, I belong to you. You're the reason that I live. Come on home, come on home. That I breathe. Jesus, I believe in you. Jesus, I belong to you. Oh, come on, you give him a better hand than that. You're the reason that I live. You're the reason that I do. Well, praise God you guys gave. 
Look, real quick, this is a guy that's going to pray with you. See this guy waving at you over here? He's a really good guy. No weird stuff goes on. He's going to pray with you, give you some free stuff. He's going to tell you about a program we have that will help you go get strong and stay courageous with the things of God. Let us help you, okay? Because you're, you're going to be new Christians. You need help to keep on going. So let us help you. We're putting in our application to help you and love you through the process, and it's going to be great. And it only takes a few moments. People came with to wait for you. So make a left turn. Follow Pastor Joel right over there. Would you do that? Come on, give the Lord a great big praise. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God that I'm saved and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.